Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Carla Harmeth, and I am a associate professor of abdominal radiology in Chicago at University of Chicago. I am the chief of abdominal radiology here, and I'm going to talk to you about how to read your radiology reports. Here are my credentials. So the overview of this lecture, we're going to start with a little introduction. We're going to talk about imaging in neuroendocrine tumors, what is best, and how to recognize a good report. The objectives are to familiarize with the different types of imaging, get empowered to have an open discussion with the physicians about which type of follow-up imaging to get and why, and to be able to get a basic comprehension of some radiology terms in order to understand your reports. So in the introduction, um, a lot of people don't know, but radiology is a medical specialty, and radiologists are physicians who interpret the imaging exams. They have a minimum of five years of specialty training or residency after medical school. Most radiologists in a tertiary care center or university center will have a more extensive training that is dedicated to a specific part of the body. This is obtained by doing a fellowship after those five years of residency, and these fellowships can be one, two years or more. So imaging in neuroendocrine tumor. Imaging is one of the most accepted ways of diagnosing and following up neuroendocrine tumors. The technologists are the professionals who obtain the images. And these technologists do have a specific training in their modalities. For example, there are technologists who have specialties in magnetic resonance imaging, computer tomography, ultrasound, x-rays, fluoroscopy, and nuclear medicine. They are the ones who help us radiologists get, the, get your images so we can interpret them. So usually you get greeted and scanned by a technologist once you get to the radiology suite. And this is an example of a technologist scanning a patient. So when you arrive and you're getting your exam, the patient is greeted and seen by the technologist and nurses in radiology. Usually us, the radiologists, are going to stay hidden in this reading room near the scanner. So we are nearby to aid and help with any problems, but we're not directly seeing you as a patient. We're seeing your images. So we're in this background room, which have a lot of computers we call workstations, where we get the images and we interpret them. So this will be what I do, I sit there in front of all the images we get from you and I try to interpret them, uh, comparing them with others, give your doctor report and yourself a report. The types of imaging most commonly used for neuroendocrine tumors include computer tomography, a CT or CAT scan, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, and positron emission tomography or PET. What is the difference between those? So computer tomography does use radiation, which gets blocked or absorbed by different organs at a different degree. So that's what allows us to see the differences between bone, fat, air, and other organs and tissues, for example. And this is an example of a CT machine for those of you who haven't seen one. These are the types of images we get a CT exam, and that's what I see when I uh, get images on the, in the reading room. Magnetic resonance imaging is another modality which uses a strong magnetism to align the protons or the hydrogen molecules in our bodies. We then apply a radio frequency to shift them around, and when they are recovering or aligning back with the big magnet is when we get the So since every organ or tissue have a different amount of protons, we get a different signal or shade of gray from different areas. And this is an MRI machine for those of you who haven't seen one. It's very similar to the CT machine. You can see that donut or the bore is a little bit longer. And that's a big magnet. These are the types of images we obtain with MRI. And to some of you, they may look very similar to the CT scan exams. But to us radiologists, they're quite different. Positron emission tomography uses radiopharmaceuticals, which are substances with a radioactive component in them. They get injected in your vein. The most common and specific radiopharmaceutical for neuroendocrine tumors is the dotatate, which binds to the somatostatin receptors in neuroendocrine tumors. However, the most prevalent PET radiopharmaceutical that you may have heard of is FDG, which uses glucose bound with a radiopharmaceutical. So most tumors in general in life, they use glucose more than tissues do. That's how we see them using the FDG. In the case of neuroendocrine tumors, however, not all of them use a lot of glucose, and that's why other substances like the dotatate were developed. And this is a PET scanner, and most of the times the PET scan is combined with a CT scan or MRI in order for us to localize where tumors are, and they, they may have both exams at the same time. 
these are the images we get. So uh, the first one is a CT scan that we get together with the second one, which is a PET exam. And usually we fuse them at the end to try and localize the areas of activity or the areas of tumor. So what is best? Let's talk a little bit about the pluses and minuses of each modality. So CT exam is very fast, it costs less, it's more reproducible, meaning everywhere in the world you go, the images are very similar. And it's less susceptible to motion. Let's say you're short of breath and you cannot hold still because of pain. A CT scan is obtained in a few or less than one minute, so that's less susceptible to motion. However, it does include radiation and contrast. MRI, on the other hand, is very sensitive to the different tissues, so it's easier for me, for example, to see a lesion in the liver compared to the liver parenchyma or normal liver itself. Different types of contrast can be used, so it can help differentiate and better quantify lesions, for example, and there's no radiation. However, it is less reproducible. Not everywhere in the world we have the same types of protocols for MRI, and not every machine produces the same quality of imaging. It's more susceptible to motion because it takes a little longer to acquire, so if we move a little bit, the machine may not know exactly where the lesion was or the organ is, and I get blurred images. And it's more expensive, also usually needs contrast. PET dotatate is very specific for neuroendocrine tumors and very reproducible. However, it does use radiation, and usually we need a concomitant CT or MR scan to locate the activity or where tumors are, and it's the most expensive of all. So what is the best imaging modality, right? It depends. For the initial imaging, when you're having pain and you want to find out what's going on, a CT exam is usually best because it's very fast. If you're a patient with symptoms and for emergencies, usually, again, CT exam is very fast and very reliable. MRI, however, is one of the best modalities for visualization and quantification of liver metastasis, and it's a key exam whenever we're planning resection or treatment of metastasis. A PET exam, on the other hand, is very sensitive and can help locate lesions that may not be visible in certain organs or diseases in lymph nodes that may otherwise look normal by other modalities. By CT and MR, for example, we use size to say if a node is abnormal most of the times, and PET can actually detect abnormality in very small nodes that if I look at an MR, I say, oh, it's probably normal. But if it's active on the PET, that does not mean it's normal. So basically, we should tailor the images to the needs of our patients. One important thing to realize is the imaging is just one component of your medical journey, and it does need to be interpreted in the context of every individual. For example, I see a lesion, it may be getting larger, but this could be because there's inflammation from a treatment response, like your body is reacting to it. Sometimes it's larger because the tumor is worse, sometimes because there was a local treatment. So clinical input from your other treating doctors is very important for me as a radiologist to interpret what I see in an exam. Sometimes we can only differentiate between a treatment response or growth after a follow-up exam. So you may not know that radiologists may not have access to your exams if they're not done at the same institution. We keep a record of your exams at the same institution. However, if you have an exam done even at a institution, it does not mean we share the images and we can see each other's images. So it's very important for us to have previous images as diseases have an evolution pattern. And a finding in one exam may mean something very different if it's unchanged from prior or if it's a new finding. For example, in this case, I have a set of exams. The patient showed up with a tiny thing and that arrow is pointing to a lesion in the liver. The second row of exams, it's a little larger. Third row, it got smaller and then it kind of stayed the same. So in this case, I know the evolution, correct? However, if I only have this, I don't know if it's getting worse, if it's the same, if it's a new finding. If I only have this, oh, it's a stable disease or maybe getting a little bit better. If I have this, it's definitely getting worse. The lesions are larger. So that tells you how important it is for me to have a uh, distribution over time of how things are looking. Moving on to understanding your radiology reports. So most places we use a structured report to provide a radiology report. This is to make the report easier to read. Most templates, especially in the US, are pre-populated. They come with some basic language. At the University of Chicago, for example, specifically in abdominal imaging, our templates come pre-populated, no significant abnormality noted, as some of you who have imaging with us may notice. And you should know also that radiologists have a different level of sensitivity on what to include as a significant finding and what to leave out as a non-important finding. I'm showing here an example of our template. So if you see, um, you know, I have lung bases there, no significant abnormality, and that comes up. However, 
if I'm looking at your exam and I find something abnormal, I'll replace that by there's a nodule in the lung base or there is an opacity that may represent pneumonia and so on. So understanding your report, the first step, you have to know which modality was used, CT, MRI, PET, and then is there contrast or not? So what is contrast? It's a substance that we use to try and differentiate the way organs, vessels, and abnormality look in computer tomography and magnetic resonance imaging. So you see the first imaging where the black arrow is. I mean, that's again in the liver. I don't see much in the first image. That's a null contrast image. The second image, however, is a consim. And you can see that that area, the arrow is pointing to an area there's a little bit less bright or you know darker than the parenchyma. So I know there's a lesion there and I know I need to address that. In addition to contrast, MRI also uses what we call different sequences in which organs, fluid, and other structures will have a different appearance. And this is why MR takes so much longer, right? Because every single one of these images that I'm showing is a different sequence and also at a different time. So every one of those is obtained for the entire abdomen at one point. So that's why you may see it in the machine for 20 minutes to half an hour or more. So both CT and MR can use different contrasts, oral and intravenous. The oral contrast can help the radiology differentiate bowel from masses and may not be always needed. The intravenous contrast helps to see lesions and abnormalities, the detailed anatomy, vessels, and differentiate those normal structures in the organs from the organs itself, themselves. PET will use radiopharmaceuticals intravenously. Intravenous contrast for CT is most commonly iodine-based, and intravenous contrast for MRI is most commonly gadolinium-based. Of that, there are two main subtypes. One of it is much more vascular, and the other one also goes into the hepatic or liver cells. The latter is called hepatobiliary agent, and it's commonly used to look for neuroendocrine tumor metastasis in the liver. So your doctor may order a specific MRI with hepatobiliary agent uh, to evaluate metastatic neuroendocrine tumor to the liver. And why all that? Why all this contrast? And this is how the radiologist can differentiate a normal tissue, benign, indeterminate, and malignant lesion. The contrast, the different timing in which we image the contrast in the body, as well as the different sequences in MRI, for example, will help me recognize lesions and try to describe them and uh, let you know what they are. Certain lesions have very specific descriptors that can be very specific. And I can really say, okay, this is a hepatocellular carcinoma, for example, or this is a benign hemangioma. Other lesions do not. But that's why I need all this, to try my best and be able to classify the lesion and help you out. In order to understand your report, you have to know a little bit of those weird terms that we use. So the radiology report will include some specific radiology terms as well as terms related to the modality used. For example, in CT, common descriptors include density, which is the tone of gray or the attenuation of gray, attenuation of X-rays, the enhancement, the amount of contrast that goes into an organ or into a lesion. And that enhancement is uh, timed in arterial, mostly in the arteries, venous, mostly in the veins, or delayed after it's kind of washed out from both. And these are among other descriptors that we use. MRI, some descriptors include signal intensity, enhancement, which is also the same thing as CT, the arterial enhancement, early, venous, or delayed. But also, it will include how things look on all those different sequences that I told you, which are labeled T1, T2, diffusion, and so on. Those names are a little uh, different, but that's how we recognize lesions and how they behave. Terms that are used in PET include active, metabolically active, uptake, or SUV, which is standard uptake value. And a PET exam will be usually combined with a CT or MR to better locate the area of activity. So why so many words? Why can't we just say the tumor is worse? There's a lesion that is not a tumor. There is an infection. Medical language is needed in order for doctors to have a more profound understanding of what's happening. And we need to be on the same page. However, we as physicians should be able to explain what the overall meaning is in easy terms for patients whenever needed. So how to read your report? The body of the report will have usually descriptors to justify the impression we're going to have at the end. So there should be an impression at the end or a conclusion on every radiology report that should summarize the overall findings and what they mean. Sometimes it can be very objective. Sometimes I can really say what it is specifically because of the characteristics. Sometimes it needs to include possibilities, a lesion that is not very specific, could be this, this, or that. And sometimes, you know, I have to say, I don't know what it is. We need further imaging or we may need a biopsy. So this is the reason why it's important for us radiologists and your doctors to work as a team and with you so we can interpret the imaging findings in the context of your own clinical finding. How to recognize a good report. 
In my thought, a good radiology report should have a balance of detail, description, or objectivity. The radiologist should be able to provide a conclusion stating if the findings favor a benign process, a malignant process, infection or inflammation, progression, or improvement of disease process. When a more concrete diagnosis can, cannot be made, there should be a guidance on what next step would be helpful. Like I would recommend an MR or I recommend a uh, PET exam, for example. The radiologist should also be available to discuss the report with the ordering physician. So good radiology service, you know, will have your radiology physician available to your other physicians to be able to go over your findings and come up to a conclusion again in that context of your clinic history. Uh, many of you may ask, should I go to a general radiology place or a specialized place? Does it really matter? Does it make any difference? So I think it will depend on what you're looking for. Most radiologists are able to recognize basic disease. Everyone that goes under a five-year residency training should be able to recognize basic things. But one thing to remember is that a general radiologist has to know a little bit about everything. They have to know neuro, they have to know abdominal imaging, musculoskeletal imaging. In my case, as a subspecialty radiology, I'm able to have a more knowledge of very specific disease patterns. So sometimes that can be more helpful. It's like you know, having a uh, general contractor or a you know, handyman versus a plumber. So in summary, make sure you're getting the exam that is adequate for your symptoms or disease. Your doctors, including the radiologists at the institution you seek treatment, should be able to guide you. Exams to follow up neuroendocrine tumors should be performed with intravenous contrast whenever possible. We may not be able to see tumors or metastasis without it. A good radiology report should use a comparison whenever available. A good radiology report should have descriptors of the findings. And it's best if the radiology report is objective, that gives an answer or guidance on what to do next. It needs to add value to your treatment and it needs to help you and the treating physicians navigate this journey. With that, I thank you and I'll be available to answer any questions and you can email me if you have any uh, questions or concerns. Mm.